Alrighty, so why don't we uh, get settled so uh, Bradford can get started with his presentation. Um, Bradford Stevens is uh, down here uh, from Seattle, Washington, uh, his company Drawn to Scale. Uh, he uh, was kind enough to come to LinkedIn to present, so uh, please give him a welcome and uh, thank you for coming. Thanks for the invite. Good? Cool. So I don't know if you guys got a chance to catch the summary, but I want to talk about making your life suck less. And minimizing the suck in your life is a really great thing. It's one of my favorite hobbies because we all like to be happy. In specific, we're going to talk about how to make your life better when you're building scalable systems. Um, you guys at LinkedIn certainly have to deal with this problem, and more and more companies have to deal with big data problems. So I've gone around, and I've talked to smart people, and I've blogged. You can catch my blog at roadtofailure.com about you know general array of best practices, anecdotes, and just tips on building scalable software and how we need to, how we can adjust our ways of thinking from building classic like three-tier web apps, change our thinking from that to building scalable distributed systems. So a little bit about me, my favorite topic. Um, I'm one of the founders at Drawn to Scale. Um, we're a distributed platform company, and before that I was a lead engineer at Visible Technologies. Visible does uh, BI and analytics on top of social media. Quite a lot of big data there. Um, computer scientist, like I imagine most of you guys are, from University of North Florida, small school, great CS program. And I've had a myriad of former careers in politics, music, finance, and consulting, each to varying degrees of success, but always interesting stories behind those. So a little bit about Drawn to Scale. We are a startup, and we are trying to build the platform to handle big data, data ingestion, processing, storage, and search. We want to make it really easy for small companies to um, use hundreds of terabytes just as easily as they would a normal database. And um, we're building several products on top of that, including Big Log, which is log analytics on you know, the terabyte scale, Big Search, which is faceted distributed search, and um, Big Message, which is a large distributed message queue. Uh, each of these are problems that a lot of companies have to tackle and solve, and more and more are doing it each day. So we want to make it easier for people. So distributed software is something that I've been doing for a while. So we're going to go over a few broad topics today. Um, I'm going to give a general overview of why big data matters and why we need to change how we think about dealing with data. I'm going to go over operations, um, sort of the day-to-day -day works of um, what it means to deal with large amounts of data and how you change how software is run, managed, and deployed. Talk about engineering, you know, the deep stuff, um, general computer science, and just ways to build your software better. And finally, some sort of businessy and processy stuff. Um, just how you should adjust your business thinking or how you can talk with business people about your big data platforms. Because everybody in the business field usually knows what a database is. You know, it's this thing where you put data. And we have to sort of shift that thinking from thinking about everything you do with your data goes in a database to putting, you know, really thinking about how you manage and use your data. So it's important. Big data concerns not just engineers, but it concerns everybody, even at the business level. Um, and so, yeah, it's really it's important to understand the context of our big data problems so we know how to cope with this sort of back-end problem here. So big data really changes how we deal, um, you know, how we deal and handle with our distributed systems and handle big software. Um, and by big data, I mean basically data that fits on or that can't fit on a single machine or can't fit on a machine, single machine and be used very quickly. So really, any, almost anything a terabyte and up. And when it comes to building these big back-end systems, the bar is really set higher here. Like, we're all, we're all sort of dealing with this now at the very ground level, 
where whether it's Hadoop or HBase or Cassandra or you know, rolling a system that allows you to roll out um, 100 servers to serve a web app, it's something that previously was niche, but it's becoming more and more important. And there's no real like stack, like your, um, you know, your LAMP stack or the Microsoft.NET stack. There's not really a defined standard here. So we're all really in the trenches. And that means that um, you have to have really good engineering in order to succeed here. It's not like, I mean, I'm sure most of us in college, we knew how to install a SQL server and you, know, you could get MySQL up, put some tables in there, put some data in there. And you know, up until now, those skills would carry you pretty far. But, and you didn't need to be that advanced to pull it off. But now, since we're here on the ground floor of these big systems, you're not gonna even be a little bit successful unless you really know what you're doing or everything's gonna take a long time. It's gonna ground to a halt. That's why we need to change the way we think about dealing with big data. Um, so sort of now more than ever, scalability matters. Um, and this web scale data, you guys deal with it, especially with your social graph, blogs and social media deal with it. It tends to be unstructured or at least oddly structured. It doesn't fit in the tables and rows. And it's really interconnected. Like I can just think of my Facebook profile and all the facets of information I have and you know, I'm a big fan of Iron Maiden, so I want to know for people who are also fans of Iron Maiden and also like to wear cool shoes. It's data, it doesn't fit into tables and rows like at all. And thus, like databases and the way we think about data typically, it doesn't really cope that well. And I think, based on what I've seen, the big catalyst here has been social media. Uh, and things like MySpace, Facebook, Twitter, and all that. It's all kind of messy, it's unstructured, but there's a lot of really good information in there. And very seldom does this information just fit on one machine. And I'm sure you guys have discovered this more and more, but you can't throw anything away. All your data is important. Now it's not just like who visits your Facebook page, it's who visits your Facebook page, what they clicked on, what order they clicked on it in, if they moused in the general direction of your friends, or you know how long it took for these three images to load on the page, you know, absolutely everything is important now to optimize a user experience and to get good data and to drive our company. We can't throw any of that away, and you can't really stick it in just a SQL server. And again, as you guys have discovered, your data size is not anywhere remotely correlated to your business size. Um, now anybody can get a Twitter Firehose feed or run a MapReduce job in Amazon over 100 servers to get you know, hundreds of terabytes of data really easy. 10 years ago, only IBM or Oracle or Microsoft really cared about data on the terabyte stage. But now, you know, even a little one or two person company who wants to do, say, Twitter analytics, they have to care about how big their data is. And it's a problem that very few of us have had to really deal with before is why we have sort of this big problem of how in the world do we handle this data. So what we typically do uh, when you have data is you put it in a database. I mean, it's the base where your data lives. It's all you should need. And databases are really good at quite a few things. Um, you know, financial data, anything that's really structured and normalizable, like just serving a web page, even though they're certainly not optimal for that. Um, or again, thinking about your Facebook page, um, you can kind of see how it fits into tables and rows in your database. You know, a table for users or a table for your friends or something like that. Um, so just the data structure alone, if you can think of it in tables and rows, it tends to be something that you would try to put in a database. Databases don't scale cheaply at all. You know, you could buy a $10,000 server to get twice the performance of that, you have to buy a $40,000 server, get twice the performance of that. You buy a $100,000 server, double for your performance again, you give a significant portion of your soul to Oracle. It just stops really quickly. And you can't deal with what you're putting into it, especially if it's unstructured. And the more data you put into your database, the less features you can have. There's a lot of guys out there on how to make 
MySQL scale, for instance, and it says turn off the indexes and don't use so many joins and you know store your data as ones and zeros instead of you know strings and sort of the more data you try to shove in there and still get it to go fast, the more features you turn off. So pretty quickly, your database just turns into an indexed flat file by a primary key. That's not very useful to anybody. And traditional database, as we all know, is optimized for a single node. Um, you can add more and more hard drives with a SAS array, and you can add more and more CPUs and RAM. But after that, you're sort of on your own if you want it to physically work on more than one machine. And um, as we've seen probably many times, when you try to hand roll your own distributed database, it's, it's just a nightmarish problem. Your database is really limited to a single node or a very small handful of scalable data warehouse people or Oracle. And if you think about it, what we typically do with the database, 90% of what we do with it is about 5% of what it can do. You store stuff, you retrieve stuff, you um, do some filtering, you count some rows, you group your data, that's it. So you pay hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars to do these five operations on your data. And yet the database itself, your typical RDBMS, is structured so that it can do tons of things from averages to you know, indexing word counts. Um, it's sort of a jack of all trades, Swiss army knife. And because of that, it's really crippled in terms of scalability because it has to do anything you ask of it. So we've got all this data, social media, it's graphs, or it's just giant hunks of unstructured text from a billion blogs. And it doesn't fit on one machine, so we've got to make it distributed. We've got to put all this data somewhere or many places. So you've got to build this distributed cluster, and you've really got to optimize it for the problems you're solving. Um, I know LinkedIn has talked about your specialized like graph and memory database you have, and um, you've got faceted search on Lucene. These are both things you could have done with a typical database, but they'd be horribly slow, and it would just break. So there's no Swiss Army knife for these problems in this new distributed world. You've really got to figure out what you want to solve and how you're going to solve it. And when we say distributed, we typically want sort of shared nothing architecture, any machine dies, don't care, with commodity boxes. Um, had sort of a hard time explaining what commodity boxes was to one of my old managers. He thought that, okay, that means if it's commodity, we can just buy a bunch of used boxes that, you know, have a seller on decor and cost us 50 or 100 bucks. And I'm like, no, nah, commodity means you know, $1,500 to $2,500 instead of 50000 and you can buy them in bulk. So commodity doesn't mean dirt cheap. It doesn't mean a million 386s. It means 1,000 quad-core machines or 1,000 eight-core machines. And linear scale costs is another thing. I mentioned earlier that, you know, you go from $50,000 to $50 million pretty quickly when you want to have a really big database. Um, so it's got to be able to scale linearly. If I want twice the performance, I should be able to buy about twice the boxes. So where are we now? Like, how do we deal with this? Well, 20 years ago, things were different. Memory was scarce, cores were scarce, storage was scarce, everything was expensive. That's the kind of environment a typical database was born in. Save each individual byte, save each individual processor cycle, at any cost, whether it took you 50 DBAs to optimize or whatever. Um, but nowadays, the most important thing we care about is the customer experience. You know, we want low latency, we want large amounts of data. The most important thing is not, you know, um, I guess the most important thing is no longer making life easier by hiring some cheap DBAs and putting it on one server. Uh, customer experience really drives everything. And that means you have to structure your entire organization and your engineering a certain way. Um, our, most, our most scarce resource is engineers, you know, smart people, people who can solve these kinds of problems. Engineers have always been scarce, but 20 years ago, the general thinking was, I get a database, I throw enough engineers at the problem, it tends to go away. Um, 
that doesn't really exist anymore. Good engineering is so scarce that we don't want to have, have something that takes lots of engineering time to maintain. The next most expensive thing after engineering is fast I.O. Whether you're talking about RAM or, thank goodness, now we have SSDs or massively networked SAS arrays. Um, sort of low latency I.O. is extremely expensive. So again, you've got to really optimize around getting small bits of data through your system quickly. But what's really cheap is storage. And it turns out to be a big savior because you can minimize the amount of I.O. you can do. And you can minimize the amount of engineers you have. And you can maximize your customer experience because you know that, well, if something looks hard, you can throw it across 5,000 machines with five terabytes of storage each. And you don't care about structuring your data to be minimally stored. It's really a godsend because since storage is cheap and boxes are cheap, we can tackle all these other problems just by being smart and by building good systems. So this new world of highly scalable systems and needing to have a good customer experience, knowing that engineers are rare, and having to store data on one, more than one machine, it all boils down to something uh, James Hamilton calls recovery-oriented computing. And it basically means that your data is seamlessly partitioned, keep it across 100 servers, 1,000, 50,000 servers. It's synchronously redundant, meaning if something dies, something else replaces it really quickly. Or even, and again, this is open to your use case interpretation, but your writes should never fail, or your reads should never fail, or something dies, it shouldn't give me a call at 2 AM. And it's heavily monitored. Um, you need to know every action to as much detail as possible that every machine is performing. And as I said in a previous slide, you can do all these things now because storage is cheap. Um, put four terabytes of data on one node, and you can record every action it does, analyze it, and zip it up every day. You can have huge logs, and it won't impact your performance. So by sort of combining these things, um, you end up with this concept of recovery-oriented computing where I can distribute anything, I can know everything that's going on, and it's really easy to manage. And if something dies, I don't need to care about it. So how do we implement recovery-oriented computing? I want to talk about it from an operations and engineer and a kind of a business perspective. We just got some general guidelines here or some tips. And going through these, um, it should help us understand how we shift our thinking from um, you know, my database and my web server and maybe a backup somewhere to 25,000 computers. So a lot of this is sort of in the murky area between changes we need to make in operations and changes we need to make at an, and the engineering side. So you want to really think about how we move the system administrator to box ratio from um, you know, two boxes per sysadmin. I guess this ratio is actually reversed. Two boxes per sysadmin to 200 boxes per sysadmin to 2,000 to 1. And this really isn't limited to your pet sysadmin or your ops guys. As devs, we all really care about this too because when things go wrong, they don't know how to fix it. We have to fix it. So to make our lives easier, we have to make their lives easier. So ops is something that we really need to care about as engineers. So in general, we know that engineers build stuff and ops manages stuff. Yes, engineers can you know, help operations set up deployment plans, and operations can write scripts. But in general, we build stuff, and they make it run and keep it running. But when problems come up, what happens is developers typically code and automate the problem away. Um, ops people, they can't touch the code base. They have to hire. And as we saw earlier, engineers and people in general are our most scarce resource. So when something goes bad in a distributed system, 
it's not something that you just log in and, you know, oh, I forgot to put an index in that column or, oh, this ETL isn't running, let's kick it off again. When something goes wrong because it's such a new field, something usually goes seriously wrong. And the ops guys will want to hire to mitigate it. You know, oh, this job needs to be kicked off every 30 minutes manually. Uh, I guess we'll have to hire an ops guy to do that. Whereas engineers will say, um, again, this is in a total vacuum. Any SANES ops person would probably kick their local engineer and be like, why the hell do I have to do this manually? But um, ops people will have to hire to solve that problem. Whereas a dev guy, we would go, okay, well, this isn't running. There's a bug somewhere. Let's go fix it. So if you really want something fixed and automated, devs need to be on call as much as ops guys. This totally sucks, and I've been there for a year. But when something goes wrong, if you make it the responsibility of both engineering and operations, and we're getting the calls and they're getting the calls, then we have to work together to fix the problem. It's, um, or well, I'll put it this way, you'll quickly see that the number of calls that you get at 2 a.m. reach an asymptote at zero because I don't want to fix that. And as nice as we usually are, I know in the past I didn't really lose much sleep when the ops guy screwed something up in the database and they had to restart it every day. It wasn't my problem at 2 a.m. But when it is our problem, you get something on your feature backlog and you get it fixed. And because we're at such large scales, you know, you have to do this or otherwise the problems are just going to sit there. And they will, you'll hire, you'll have to hire more and more people to fix them. Configuration is really important these days, especially because all these frameworks like Hadoop and HBase or Gearman, they're all really new. It's not like SQL, Microsoft SQL Server, where you stick in a CD, have an ISO, you do a few clicks, and you add a username, and it's perfect. Configuration isn't second class anymore. As engineers, we really have to understand each setting of 50 in that stupid .properties file or the site.xml file. Um, we have to care about this because when configuration is wrong, it's not just a little bit slow or something seems off or this select statement doesn't work quite right. When configuration is wrong, it tends to have odd repercussions. Uh, one example I had, I can think of is, I had um, my HBase out of 20 machines, um, one of them was pointed was occasionally, for whatever reason, pointing to a wrong master node. And 19 writes out of 20 would work fine, but then once in a while it would give me a totally useless error message like, this region is not online. And I'm like, yeah, region's right there, it works fine. Turns out that it couldn't talk to the region. And that was just some obscure problem. Or another problem I had was I would have an indexing job in Lucene um, die after 1.9 hours and was because I didn't give it quite enough RAM. It's all this trial and error stuff that you have to sit there and kick for months. I'll tell you right off the bat that we spent more time messing with configuration than actually writing code as engineers. And you can do, um, you know, there's things out there like uh, CF Engine and Chef to manage configuration and they take some of the workload off but it's not perfect. It's better than nothing, and it's often better than having a bunch of rsync scripts. But and it's not, you can't totally hand um, Chef off to your ops guys. The engineers have to know what they're configuring and why. And actually, thanks to the fact that it's built in Ruby, um, engineers can actually write code to do configuration. So. It's not second class anymore. We've got to really pay attention because we're nailing together all these new frameworks, especially when they're open source. And test doesn't really exist anymore, which kind of sucks. Um, you know, in a typical world, if you were running on 10 machines in production, you had a few web servers, you had a few databases, you know, a backup server, or your DNS or whatever, you would just buy those same exact boxes and stick them in your test cluster. But now you can't do that because if you're running on more than 100 boxes or certainly more than 1,000 boxes, there's no way 
that your test cluster is going to operate exactly like a production cluster. Anything could be different. You could be using cables from a different manufacturer or switches from a different manufacturer or your power may be dirtier or cleaner or you may have hard drives from a different batch one day than the next day. That's basically, it's really, really hard to control. And we often find that, oh, test isn't going quite as fast as production, let's add a few more boxes. Um, the problem is pretty much production and test end up costing the same. So test is great, but really all of your serious testing is done in production. And that really sucks. Um, but we have to acknowledge that. Because if you're in production and you're testing, you know that things are going to go bad or you know that there's not absolutely perfect code in there, you can design your entire environment around the fact that things are going to fail. And you know, if, you're in, if test is in production, then you are always testing, which make the QA guys happy. But you know, it's always sort of in the back of your head that when you push something or when you see a bug out in production, you know, it's always being tested. So in production, you need to simulate failures that would happen, you know, things that we would typically do in test environment. That means, you know, browning out your power or, you know, pulling a few things out of your rack or um, messing with your switch configuration, you know, yanking out cables, just throwing in new boxes with minimal configuration. You need to hit production as hard as you would hit testing because Production is the only place where stuff really happens. There's a technique called the canary in the coal mine. And it's sort of, you know, it's a good exemplar of this mentality in that you've got, um, you have a box in there. And if you think about your load sort of like as a tide, you know, at noon, everybody, you know, is on their lunch break, they log into LinkedIn check their profile, and at 6 p.m. there's another peak when they get home and update their status and bitch about something. Um, you need to be aware of that and make it configurable so that when you're running, um, you can actually overload select portions of your infrastructure. So run a box at 175% load or run an entire rack at 175% load or 200%. And Hopefully, if you built a good architecture, those things, if they start failing, you'll be able to take actions and mitigate that, whether it's by throttling your connections or something else or trimming out some data that shouldn't be there. Those boxes will fail before everything else. And it goes back to the fact that production is test, and that gives you some advantages because you'll always have a very realistic load. You'll have the actual load in production. So you've got to be aware and you've got to develop techniques into how you actually test your data and in production. Deployment's another really tricky thing. Um, you know, beforehand we would, we have our dev environment, we've got a test environment, you might have staging, then you have production, and they're each two or three servers. But when those things aren't really relevant because they don't have realistic data loads or they don't have the exact same hardware configuration, which always happens, you have to instead really do deployment gradually. You know, push new code to one box in your system or two boxes or a rack. And although it's always a good practice, again, we have to really kick up our notch when it comes to handling engineering. And you've got to code granularly and backwards compatible. So if I deploy something to one box, it's not going to break what's on the other 20,000 boxes or deploy it to one rack. And then you gradually put more and more data in your system. It's hard and it sucks, but people can do it. Flickr does um, like 50 or 100 pushes to production a day. And their infrastructure is so robust that when something breaks, we as users don't really notice. And they can go in and fix it right away. And um, you know, there's no consequences to it breaking because they've kept in the back of their minds that things are always going to fail. In fact, built to fail. And that used to be the motto of a lot of Web 1.0 startups, but now we have to, um, you know, it's actually a good motto to have. We have to assume that nothing will ever work perfectly. 
a lot of times we like to look at our boxes or look at our system or you know look at our ganglia board and be like okay that's responding to ping and it's putting out an average number of requests it's working perfectly you know we think if it's on it's working if it's off it's not working that's rarely the case um, you know in a typical database world when your database is either working or it needs to be kicked a little or it's just completely dead that doesn't really happen now. Something could be acting slow or it could be acting squirrely every 12 hours or every 16 hours. And when you've got 2,000 of these boxes to deal with, you can't care about that anymore. If something is acting a little bit, like a little bit squirrely, just kill it. Stop that box completely, take a note of it. And when you swap out your machines every Friday, you know, swap that out and take a harder look, you know, examine your logs. But We've really gone past the point where one hero has to log into the database to save everything. Because if that database goes down, everything goes down. Now, we, can, we don't give machines the benefits of the doubt. If something is acting weird, just kill it. And a lot of systems can fail at the same time. You know, if you lose a switch or somebody trips, trips over a cable or something like that. So, yeah, we'll see hard drives fail on occasion or, you know, too much RAM errors cause strange problems. But more often than not, problems happen in clusters. That means your machines have to be topology aware. They have to know where they are, what data center they're in, what rack they're in, so that you can route around that. A good example of this is actually Hadoop. They have data locality concepts, and every Hadoop machine knows what rack it's on, um, well, yeah, what rack it's on, um, who its other friends on that rack are, what racks like share a switch, and what data center you in. And it will actually fail elegantly based on that. And finally, as I mentioned earlier, the reason why you want to kill stuff when it's acting just a little weird instead of when it's totally dead is you really got to avoid false negatives. If something's wrong and you don't know something's wrong, or you don't know exactly what's wrong, you're probably going to lose customer data. It'll forget to write, or it'll be slightly overwhelmed, past the throttling point, and it's not going to retain that. So again, as we talked about in one of the first slides, if the most important thing you care about is the customer experience, then you can't afford false negatives. You have to kill something the second it acts weird before it has lasting consequences on everything. This is actually really good. Because if you're not staying up late at night worrying about this one box failing and it cascading to a million other fails, or a box putting out bad data that's not so bad that it just kills itself, then you're OK. If you know that if something's going to fail and it's just going to, you know, it happens and everything will recover elegantly, then you sleep more at night. And when something goes wrong, you pull stuff immediately and Engineers can sit there and put the problem in their backlog and solve it with code instead of a bunch of ops guys up till 4 a.m. for a month kicking this thing. So we've moved from operations and want to talk a little bit about engineering, kind of computer science-y stuff, engineering stuff. And the main thing to remember here is that we're building application, or sorry, we're not building applications, we're building systems software. And you care about speed, and you care about logging, and you care about reliability and failover, and if your write is really going to be written. And you care about you know, what happens when I use 7.9 on my 8 gigs of RAM. You have to really be aware of what you're doing from a true engineering and true computer science perspective. We're not building a model in Rails, as cool as it is. It's not as easy as building a model in Rails and wiring some stuff up and doing some really awesome Ajax. You have to really change your mindset from building cool web apps to it's not quite as hard as kernel hacking or device driver hacking, but certainly a level up. This is, this is serious business. This is hard stuff. As I mentioned, as I just talked about, what we're doing is very different than writing a three-tier web app. Like, um, and that's what I've typically worked on. So at Visible, when I first architected their distributed solution, I suddenly, within a week, had to care about garbage collection, collection algorithms, data structures, 
access patterns, user load, load testing, all this stuff. Um, and it's like everything, you know, it sort of starts, it just starts at what we learned in CS courses. I didn't even have a CS course in distributed computing. But when you have to troubleshoot the fact that um, you know, you can only handle 10 users a second instead of 100 users a second on a billion documents over 50 nodes. You find out it's because you're doing garbage collection, because um, you have your generation size wrong or something like that. That's not something you typically encounter at all when you're writing Ajax or writing, you know, building a Rails app. You have to really care about the stuff at the bottom, and that means you've got to have really strong CS fundamentals. You've got to actively care about that. As a result, as awesome as databases are, your database skills and your sort of denormalization skills and how you think about tuning your database, it's all kind of useless. Um, and databases will never be completely useless, but when you have, again, you know, terabytes to petadytes of data over a thousand servers, it's not going slow beca before, because you forgot to index a column. It's going slow because you use the tree object instead of an array, and the overhead of that is 100 times that of just using an array, and you have to copy it and put it in disk, and it really comes down to you knowing your CS fundamentals. And I could do a whole talk on just CAP theorem, but CAP is really law when it comes to um, distributed machines. And to sort of summarize it, CAP stands for consistency, availability, and partitioning. And to be very vague and not perfect about it, what it means is that you can either have data that's strongly consistent, um, meaning I look at this key and value, I know exactly like that's what it's supposed to be. Available, meaning if I shoot a server, a new one comes up flawlessly, or my writes never ever fail, or my reads never ever fail, or partitioning in that if I lose an, a backbone or lose a switch or lose connectivity to a bunch of machines, um, I'm able to recover gracefully from that. And so basic just behind it is you can choose two of those. Or you can be perfect at one, really damn good at two, but you can't choose three. You have to be aware of that. So sort of a combination of CAP and distributed systems theory and computer science knowledge, you really got to know it. You don't have to be like a Leslie Lamport, but you, you've got to be aware of the basics mentioned earlier about knowing your data structure. Not everything's a table anymore. Um, there's graphs or there's keys and values or you just need giant files. Um, you got to really structure your data according to how it needs to be used. So like in a typical database we'd have a user table and a favorites table and all that and we would do a join between them. But you can't do joins across 10,000 machines. It'll just it's just not possible. Joins are really slow. So you would need to duplicate your data and denormalize it. Or if you wanted to store like your friend graph, like you guys have, um, you can't really store it in a table and then join that table to itself and join that table to itself again to get three degrees. It'll take you hours. Um, whereas if you had used a graph database, maybe something like Neo for J or something like that, if you know you're dealing with a graph, then you can make it fast. So the more your problem narrows, basically, the easier it is to scale. If I know all I need to do is, here's this blog URL and here's the HTML I scraped from it, that's like a distributed key value store. That's not a table and a row and an index in a database. Really think about your data structures and what problems you want to solve, and you'll be able to solve it big. Big data is really big. This became our pet phrase at Visible. Um, when you've got hundreds of terabytes of data, you don't like kick off a test and come back in 10 minutes and get a totally happy application. Your test passes could take hours. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I was doing distributed Lucene indexing. And you know I'd kick it off in the morning, come back six hours later, and it had failed after five hours and 58 minutes suicide inducing. You know, what fails at 1.5 terabytes of data or 80% utilization may fail at only 10 megabytes of data or 2 terabytes. Which means that 
you know, we've always talked about how we need test-driven development. We need unit tests and all that. And sometimes you can get away with it. A lot of times you can get away with it if you're sort of a good enough engineer. I know that will drive the agile people nuts, but we can't really cowboy it now because the consequences of not testing the right piece of code correctly means you might have to do a six or eight hour test and you get one chance to fix that code. And then you have a whole other day and pretty soon, this happened to me in my case, you're a month behind schedule because this one stupid test couldn't pass, couldn't index all this stuff. Another thing is when you delete data, because um, you know, it's so big, um, you should really only soft delete it. In typical database, um, they really, when they're really at capacity, um, you may want to delete a record. It'll take 30 seconds to remove it from the B tree and re-index everything. Um, and that time, 10 more records could come in. And um, since we talked about earlier, storage is cheap. It's okay to just sort of mark a record as not important or not used. And then you can um, just ignore it instead of delete it permanently. This also means that if you do something horrible that deletes all your data or screws up all your data, it's really easy to recover. Um, that's actually one of the cool things about the big table model is it's versioned and it's self-deleted. You should be starting to expect to hear this phrase a lot more if you're doing good systems engineering. No, I won't reproduce that bug for you. Why? Because production is test now. And when you have to reproduce a bug that may have happened on one of 25,000 machines, it's almost impossible to do it. Which means that you either need to fix your logging so you figure out what caused that bug, or you fix the bug yourself. When something goes wrong, the ops guys should say, or your alert system should say, hey, something's wrong. Make the code, make it go away, or figure out why it went wrong. Because you know, maybe it only happens when you have 90,000 simultaneous connections and 12% of them are from Bavaria. You'll never be able to reproduce it unless you have good logging. So you have to catch it like the first time it happens or catch it the next time it happens. There's no alternative. And you have to log everything. Um, and I can use a slight shameless plug that Drawn to Scale has a product for scalable log analysis. So you should totally be our friend. Another good engineering hint is to avoid impedance mismatch. Think about what you need with high latency, um, what you can deal with high latency, what you can deal with a low latency, what you can deal with um, a high throughput. You usually get the option of getting a lot of data eventually. Yeah, I want to do a word count on two petabytes. Or you get a little data now. Hey, I've indexed every word, and I just need to do a row lookup to find um, the word laptop. It's usually one or the other. Typical database, it acts the same whether there's 10 megabytes of data or 10 terabytes in it. It just chugs through it. We don't have that option now. We have to know explicitly what we can do in a batch way, toss into a Hadoop cluster, do MapReduce on, and what we need to get right away, like typing in your search in Google. Um, you could emulate something that works kind of like Google with one database until you put more than a few million web pages in it, then it falls over. You've got to really architect your systems around that. You can think about it in terms of like MapReduce versus sharding or indexing. What do I do with a bunch of raw data versus, or a large portion of raw data versus what's just a quick index lookup? That's just one example. And here's sort of an example of what I mean by that. Um, Visible technologies, we, and this is actually kind of similar to how Drawn to Scales infrastructure works. But, you know, we basically, we needed to get every piece of social media on the internet. So we had a cluster of machines just running Hadoop simply to collect everything on the internet that we could find, do some analytics on it. It doesn't matter if it takes you a whole minute to collect a page. You've got 50,000 other machines that are doing something else. Then we had sort of a structured store with Hadoop and HBase, where it's sort of a mixture of both batch and real time. We can do batch computations on large portions of our data, or we could select a single row with a unique ID. Or then we had sort of our super fast, very low latency, very low throughput 
uh, web cluster where we're using Lucene, Solar, Kata, now we're using Bobo and Zoe, where you can get 10 kilobytes of data or 100 kilobytes of data in m milliseconds, but you couldn't get 100 terabytes of data in a second. So we've got our slow stuff and our fast stuff. There's nothing really in between. But if we need more users, we add more Lucene boxes. We add more fast boxes. If we need to just crunch for more data, we add more cheap slow boxes. And these cheap slow boxes would just have like SATA drives, four terabytes. The really fast boxes had like 32 gigs of RAM and SSDs. So again, think about what purpose your boxes need to serve and build your architecture explicitly around those problems. Because it's either a little bit of data fast or a lot of data kind of slow. There's really nothing else. So now we can talk about the softer and more intimate side of distributed computing, how we sort of handle this stuff from a business and process perspective. So you want to hire people, because hiring engineers is good. When you have a problem, it probably means you need more engineers to fix the problem and not more ops people to mitigate the problem. And be aware of sort of context switches when you train you know, guys who have typically worked on three tier web apps. Again, not everything is a table, not everything is a row. Databases are awesome and fast, but they really work nothing like a common, common store like HBase or um, a distributed KV store like Cassandra or just a huge thing, um, like huge chunks of files like Hadoop. I've heard several times, you know, we're talking to VCs and angels and they're like, that's a cool product, show us your schema. I'm like, schema? We don't have schemas. We got this thing called Hadoop and it crunches a bunch of data. So it's really, really hard to get over that hurdle of this is not a database, this is a platform, this is a system. It does specific things. A lot of time it's not just coding anymore, especially when you nail together a bunch of open source products. You know, even if you run on things like Postgres or MySQL, you just install them and you put your data in there and they just go. But now we spend a lot more time researching and experimenting and configuring. And, you know, I'd say I spend about 70% of my time doing research and playing with stuff and 30% just making code. You've got to be aware of that and your managers has to be aware of that and your CTO has to be aware of that and your CEO has to be aware of that. You know, when they ask for a feature, you're not going to sit there, code it for a week and it's done. You have to sit there, Google for a week, configure stuff for a month, buy 100 more servers, do something else. Um, it's really got to make that clear from sort of a top-down perspective that as engineers, our worth is not just writing code, it's also solving problems. You really don't want to code all this stuff from scratch either. Um, and that sort of comes back to, it's sort of hard to do this, using the right tools to solve the right problem. You don't code your own key value store. Don't code your own graph database. Most of this stuff is open source. Go in there, um, you know, figure out, you have to really narrow down what your problem is. Like, you don't, yes, and it's really hard to sell this to managers, but yes, I need to know who all my friends' friends are, but to engineers, that really means we've got a graph. We need to know what this means, and we need to know two degrees away in a breadth-first search means go out and find a tool that solves the problem. And just because tools exist doesn't mean that using them is going to be easy. Yeah, I've got stuff like Hadoop and HBase out there. But, and you know, like with Lucene, Lucene is not, um, Lucene is not a search engine. Lucene is a library meant for searching and indexing stuff. Just because tools exist that do what you want it doesn't mean that they're turnkey. You're, we're gonna have to spend a lot less time installing and rolling features and a lot more time building infrastructures, nailing stuff together, writing pipeline code, um, doing stuff that doesn't deliver absolutely immediate business value. In general, you guys are really good about this, you should open source anything that's not your secret sauce. Um, John's team has the Zoe and the um, Fasted Search with Bobo 
and they're both features of your product, but they are not your secret features or your secret technology that drives your entire business. If you can either use open source or develop your own and open source something else, that means that you have to use less and less of our most precious resource, which is engineers. And you really want to solve your core problems here. Um, Jeff Bezos has this great talk when he tries to explain to AWS to people three years ago when it seemed like a crazy, insane idea. He says, making your own electricity doesn't make your beer better. If you're brewing your own beer, um, which is, you know, beer is the second greatest thing in the world. If you're brewing it with your own electricity, nobody's going to know. We don't care, you know. Big deal. It may give us some nerd pride. And I do love my nerd pride. But it doesn't make your product better. Write code to solve, you know, nail things together. Write code that solves your actual business problem instead of resolve, you know, regenerating the wheel. And we're all pretty good about this, but we've got to remember that it's no longer a matter of writing a web app and throwing some charts on top of a database. It's, oh, we need to do something that's like a database but totally different. So let's use 100 Microsoft SQL servers and try to shard data to each, which is what uh, MySpace does. Just doesn't work. Really, really got to focus your energy or otherwise you're reinventing all of distributed computing. And you know, in the future, there's going to be something that's like an end-to-end -end platform. We're developing one, you know, for data storage, search, analysis, and all that. And there's probably going to be other ones. So it's not always going to be like this, but at least for the near future, we all need to be more aware of what it means to be, to write scalable software. So, in summary, you've got to plan for everything to fail. And it's actually good. It's, it's liberating when you don't get a call at 2 a.m. because one of your database servers goes down. If you have a true shared nothing infrastructure, then if something dies or you think something might be acting squirrely, kill it, deal with it later. Production is now the same as test. It's always really been the same as test. We just never acknowledged it. But now we can't even pretend to build a separate test environment. I mean, yeah, you can have something with 100 servers or whatever to try to approximate production, but you're never going to get something there. So be aware of that and take machines down in production and roll things out slowly in production. Don't roll a new block release every three months because more often than not something will break and it'll be really hard to reproduce it. And we're writing system software here, not application software. I know. A lot of times, um, you know, if you're making front-end stuff, you can live, like, without computer science knowledge. You can look at APIs and stuff. You can put things in a list. You can bind things to a list and make little controls. You don't have to care what a hash table is or what a linked list is or what a graph is. Now we do again because there's no, you know, there's no one way to solve a problem. There's no one database to stick all of your data in. We really have to know the fundamentals because we're dealing with the fundamentals. Don't build it if you don't have to. Um, you know, don't be, I guess, don't be scared of the fact that your database isn't quite as useful as it used to be. Don't try to shoehorn your problems into something like a database or shoehorn it into something like Hadoop when it really needs to be in a key value store. Um, solve the right problems and use the right tools as much as you can so you can move forward to solving your business problems and not your infrastructure problems. I'm done. Thanks. So big thanks to y'alls and blog readers and all the people who helped me with this. James Hamilton, Bradford Cross, Ron Rawson, got some Flightcaster and HBase. And here's some resources that you can click on when this is sent out. Questions? Yeah, lots of questions. I love questions. Anybody? Yeah, there. Do you feel like this is, that architecting for scale is something that can be introduced gradually to an existing product, or do you feel like it's something that you, that if you don't have it, you're looking at a full redesign? No, that's an interesting question, and I've seen a little bit of both. 
Um, for example, as you saw that architecture sort of workflow earlier, um, visible technologies had to, I'm sorry, the question was, is implementing a scalable, scalable infrastructure, um, is it sort of something you can do gradually or is it an entire rebuild? And again, it really depends on your problem. Um, visible, we first rolled out just like an unfaceted search and nothing else. And we would still keep stuff in a traditional database, but also index it with Lucene. And then we were going to slowly take more and more data out of that old database and put it into a distributed database like HBase. So it really depends. But usually, you can do it in pieces, and it's OK. But there's always that one scary moment where the critical data, like all of your, you know, all of your users or something, actually, users you can usually just keep in the database. There's usually that one scary moment where you flip the switch and everything moves over, but it's a lot less scary because you've got all, you should have all the major pieces slowly worked out. It just takes planning and discipline. So um, you talked about uh, production being test. Mm -hmm. um, or if you could talk a little bit about maybe some techniques and things that you might use for, I don't know, segregating the data or like how do you run tests on production and not kind of screw everybody else up that's actually using your production equipment and data? Yeah, it's, um, it's kind of a tricky thing. I mean, if we think about production, if we think about it in terms of shared nothing and then that no machine is special, but each cluster or each group of machines should solve its own problem, then you know you may have an indexing cluster and a web app cluster and so on. It's it is sort of difficult because you can't really segregate. You know you can segregate storage for one application in one place, or if I need to access data in one way, keep it in this cluster, whereas if I need to index it, keep it in another cluster. But really, the best thing you can do is to be aware of the fact from the beginning that you may lose a rack or you may lose a node and build things around that. Um, it's really hard to like have a hard backup of your data. It'd be possible um, like to have a whole other cluster to just stream your data to and zip it. But that's a mammoth undertaking when you're working with thousands of machines. There's a really good paper linked to on that perspectives.mdorona site that talks about in detail some like explicit things, kind of like the canary in the coal mine and other tasks. But in the end, um, you have to be able to live with the fact, you have to be able to have tested it when you first roll out so you know you're not going to lose data, or you know you won't lose important data, or you can cache your rights somewhere, and then just keep bringing things down constantly so you never get complacent and you find these problems early. So pretty early on, you mentioned that IO bandwidth is an issue going forward when we are dealing with large amounts of data. Mm -hmm. Storage is cheap. So whether you're storing your data in a regular database or in some of these distributed structures, how important is compression going forward? Compression is awesome. Um, it really depends. Again, it, it all depends. If you do something like LZO compression, which is really fast and lossless, um, you can compress everything in HBase from the beginning so that when it's stored to disk, it's compressed. And when it's read off a of disk, it's loaded into memory compressed and then uncompressed in memory. And it's so fast that it is faster to uncompress it than it is to store it raw. Uh, you see something, you can see up to like a 4x to 10x boost in speed. So compression, especially really fast lawless compression, or lossless compression, is really important. Archival compression is also useful, but if you have to gzip 100 terabytes and then you need something in there later, you better be really sure you don't need it. So yeah, I guess. In general, use compression for performance enhancements, not for storage space. Any last questions? Oh, I saw a tentative hand here somewhere. 
All righty. Well, if you have any questions, uh, Bradford will be available afterwards. Thank you, Bradford. Yeah, thanks. Grab me, and I'll put them up on the blog.